Um, congratulations on the book, um, Haven. Do you think it, it helped you, the fact that you hadn't been on Skellig Michael, that you could imagine it more exactly and accurately and fiercely in a way because you actually hadn't had the experience? Well, you know, whenever I've researched historical fiction, I'm quite wary of going to the place and I often put off going to it until I have one or two drafts of the book under my belt. So when I go see the place, I can maybe fiddle with the, the landscape, you know, like what you can see from where, you know, if the mountains seem close. But I don't want to be influenced by the the pastry I had in Costa Coffee. You know, I, I don't want any of the 21st century to impose on, on the old book. And of course, it's even truer when you're writing about early medieval times, the, 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 the gap, the, the cavernous gap between us and then is so big that yes, you wouldn't want to be influenced by whatever it's like with tourists and their GoPro cameras on Skellig Michael. Um, I, I did find it a bit of a, of a sort of joke that, um, you know, that the book was so set so entirely on this island and I was trying to conjure it up so intensely and still haven't been. I'm really hoping to get there this July, but but COVID interrupted um, the, the trip I had planned. But yes, I decided to take it as a, as a pure flight of imagination. And luckily, it's a very well-documented island too. So so I was able to draw on the, you know, the the, the blogs and vlogs and, and photographs of so many other people. So it was a, it was a curious and um, an incredible intense sort of trip there in my mind um, because I, I couldn't even get to the right side of the Atlantic. I was writing this book in Canada during COVID, just sort of shutting my eyes tight and, and trying to be on Skellig Michael in the seventh century. I think for anyone who sees even pictures of the island, the first thing that comes to your mind is who came here first? How did they build? What was the plan? You know, the extraordinary sort of difficulty, for, for example, even of getting a boat in there which, which you, I think, demonstrates so well, but also what would you live on there? So so you had all of that in a way that almost like being a child looking at it saying, oh, what, how, who? Yeah, my first questions were very practical. They were mostly like, what would you do first? You know, like for instance, it's, I was looking at those I've only gone around it in a boat, right? So I was looking up at those staircases and the, the monks were lavish in their building of these staircases. They didn't just do one in the most sensible place. There are traces of staircases up many different sides of the island. So it's extraordinary the effort they put in. And it must have been very handy once they had cut these steps. It would be easier to bring things up and down. But you wouldn't do it on day one when you were concerned to get a fish for your dinner. So I found, you know, thinking as the monks, I was tormented by questions of, you know, um, I'm thinking of that that book that was very influential a while back, you know, the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You know, the steps are important, but clearly not urgent. And yet if you put them off for 10 years, then you never have the benefit of the steps to get your 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 bags of birds feathers up and down so yeah i found myself thinking highly you know pragmatic questions about what you do when but then also every now and then i'd say to myself Emma, these monks were not Robinson Crusoe. They, they weren't focused on physical survival. They had gone out of their way to make their lives as hard as possible. You know, early medieval Ireland can't have been that easy in the first place, but they chose to put aside even the comforts that were available to them in their monastery and go find somewhere more austere, bleaker, colder and harder. So it's, a, it's an odd survival story, given that the characters in it are not looking for their, their physical survival or comfort or pleasure in any way. I mean, if I were a literary critic writing a book about COVID and COVID novels, <laughs> you could see this as a COVID novel. You could also see it as a companion piece to Room in that by choosing only three characters and by focusing intensely on their relationship with each other, also on their inner lives, on their solitude, but also on the claustrophobia that they develop in the island, of how closely they sleep together, how, how, how much the rules matter, that, that we see it as a book about people being enclosed as much as people being um, out in open nature. Very much so, yes. This is not a kind of a, you know, big wild wilderness kind of nature. This is a, a very um, locked in small patch of nature um, in which um, one thing, one thing I loved about this project was that rather than having to impose a kind of a 21st century cli-fi set of anxieties, you know, climate fiction, that arose very naturally from the story. Because the minute they set foot on this island, they are starting to disrupt its ecosystem. And, um, you know, the decisions they make about whether to, you know, grab as many eggs as possible, that's going to affect 
you know, the number of birds available a month later. So it's it's a perfect kind of closed room mystery, as it were, in terms of humans and their effect on the environment. Um, and yes, as you say, it's extremely claustrophobic. I have to confess, I think I'm, I'm, I have my limits as a writer. I find it easier to handle a cast of three than a cast of millions. You know, when I read someone like, say, Jane Smiley, who you know, she's got a book about the 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 horse the horse um, business, horse riding. She has a cast of hundreds and all sorts of different settings in different countries, and she's just masterful at all that. And I just I, I feel like I, I I need to I need my limits. I need to know who my characters are and and just go as in depth as possible with them. Um, and the 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 smaller my little piece of ivory, to use Jane Austen's description of how she wrote her books, and um, the the more in control of my material I feel, which means I've I've repeatedly put my protagonists through appallingly uh, constrained and confined situations. Yes, I um, often feel um, like a bit of a they I feel like they're captor, to be honest. I mean, I see that knowledge and that idea of those limits as a kind of genius, where you know, in, in, instead of trying to you know, create a panorama, you move your camera inwards and you get a sort of intensity. And the problem the reader has and the the sort of way in which, I mean, this as a problem that your expectations always are once you have a novel about the sea, and once you have a novel about people in remote places, that some immense catastrophe is going to take place. I'm thinking about, say, Brian Moore's Black Robe, the amount of violence and cruelty, which is an, another novel set among religious people moving into a remote place. The amount of violence and cruelty. There, there's a savage sort of violence in the book. I'm thinking about Ian McGuire's recent novel, The North Water, where, you know, where a boat goes right up into the North Sea. And oh, the, the amount of frostbite, the amount of attacks, one group attacking another. So you come into this book and you think, well, this journey they're going to take from Clonmac Noise down the Shannon, out into the Shannon Estuary, and then out into the into the wide ocean, that the boat, if, if the boat doesn't turn over in this page, it's just because she's holding us for the next page. And you get a paragraph like, like Art, who's the prior, who's the leader of the three. And you get this paragraph, Art sits quite still trying to forget the fact that his robe is bedaubed in droppings. The fog is as thick as ever. The sun's only lit, not lifted it. It's lovely. Um, the boat stands as if the water thickened and congealed around it. Be calm, not a breath of wind. Everything is motionless, except for the flocks overhead keeping up their complaint. And you presume that this paragraph, which is your beautiful calm writing, is building up to a massive storm at sea in which they're going to be thrust out of the boat. <laughs> One of them is definitely going to drown, which of them is going to drown, and you don't do that. I suppose one reason is that I was really curious about this as a kind of spiritual drama, you know? I mean, if you look at things in purely secular terms, then the obvious thing for men to do on an island together is murder each other, right? So a film like The Lighthouse recently, it's like how much horror can happen with two men on one island. But I was really interested in the sort of spiritual crisis of it. I loved the idea that you know, they would bring the seeds of their own poison with them, as it were, that they would be be going off on this amazing sort of venture, this, this you know, brave journey to, to found a, a new and better and purer tiny society. And then, of course, they'd mess it all up because they would bring with them all the same pettiness and power tripping and resentment um, that that you'd have in a, in a, in a bigger group. So um, I suppose I was very interested in playing out that drama in subtle ways, you know, little tensions about um, the, for instance, there's a lot in the book about the actual um, copying. You know, it's a very static activity. It's it's not like, you know, splitting rocks or, or, or anything very dramatic. They are literally arguing over, you know, whether a little splotch of ink or a little rip in the page means you have to tear at that page and start again. So it's the drama is at a sort of a micro level between just three people. And, and yes, I suppose I wanted, you know, us to be deeply shocked by moments like when, say, Art cuts down the only tree on the island. And um, I wanted that to be horrifying. And because at this point you're you're in the mindset of of the monks for whom, you know, the, the tree, the tree was a little sort of spark of life and the idea that art would cut it down to make it into a cross that's that's a huge dramatic moment but only if you're sharing the monk's kind of tunnel vision um, and as you say i don't provide any of the the big events you'd be expecting either in terms of bloodshed or weather um i, I could have them accidentally die at any point but I, I didn't want them to i wanted this to be a sort of a a psychological and spiritual battle 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, this isn't Lord of the Flies. It isn't Robinson Crusoe. What you're what you're doing is you're attempting using an historical imagination to imagine what vows might have meant in the seventh century. To imagine, you know, that that he 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 is under God. He has asked him to come with him. They have given their vows, and therefore they're going to obey him. And up to quite a late in the novel, they they do see his authority as real. And so 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 there isn't that conflict, that natural. I mean, the reader feels the resentment, and the reader senses underneath their obedience there is resentment. But the resentment doesn't emerge for a very long time. What they do is what he says they should do, and that I think gives gives the novel a great force because you realize you're in another world. Uh, you you're in another belief world. That's a really good point, Colm, because my, my editors um, on both sides of the Atlantic kept saying, hang on, why would they not rebel? They were they were pretty much expecting and wanting the the other two to rebel on page one, you know. Um, and I, I kept saying, look, I have to take these men on their own terms. They were they were utterly serious about pledging themselves to a leader. It was a very feudal model, really. You picked your your master and you said you would give your life for him, and that's how it was. Um it's, you, you couldn't possibly exaggerate how much um, the these monks felt like um, as if they were owned. I mean, you know, there are there are lines in the early sources about a monk is a slave. Um, he has he has signed himself over. He's you know he he's allowing his religious leader to to be god to him really to have that kind of authority. So I thought it'll be all the more thrilling if there is a rebellion in the end, but it has to be hard won. Um, I mean, to me, the fascinating thing about historical fiction is really trying to understand minds not like our own because they are shaped by completely different forces. Um, the, you know, it's, it's it's not about the costumes. It's all about the mindset. And I love those moments when, of course, they have human emotions just like us and we can absolutely relate to what they're feeling, you know, um, but at other moments they're saying things like, no, I am, a, I am his vowed bondsman. And I'm thinking there's no one on earth who I would be, you know, you know, vowed to in that same obedient way. Yeah. Um, so, so I love bringing us close to historical characters, and then suddenly kind of pulling the camera back, as it were, and saying their minds are different. They are, they are, they are completely shaped by a different society. One, one yeah. challenge I really had with this book was to give give their thoughts in terms of things they had seen. So, I found myself. Um, there, there were times when they would want to describe something as, you know, like that a rock was pointy, like, say, a steeple. And then I'd think, did they have steeples? No, they didn't have steeples. I couldn't describe anything as being like money um, or like towns. Um, you know, they they just, you know, a completely different set of cultural circumstances. And how would you think within that was a, a thrilling limitation to me? Yeah, I think we're back with this idea of the genius of limitation where, Say in Brian Moore's novel *Catholics*, which is also set on an island off the west of Ireland, the drama arises from the fact that the protagonist, who's a, who, you know, who's a monk, he he really doesn't believe, and it's a crisis of faith. And suddenly, Brian Moore was fascinated by that crisis of faith. And we watch art, and we watch him for hypocrisy. He is the prior; he's the one in charge. And he doesn't suffer from hypocrisy. We watch him for weakness. He doesn't suffer from weakness. He, in fact, is who he says he is, which I think is often the hardest thing to do in a novel, that 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 you give the characters a sort of essential goodness. But his goodness comes also, of course, as a sort of strictness, as a lack of imagination, a lack of empathy. But nonetheless, he is pure. We're, we're, not, we're not watching him, uh, um, his faith fading or his, you know, his, his self, self-concept weakening. Yeah, I didn't want to go for the the easy wins of, yeah. you know, um, um, sexual weakness or hugging the food or anything. Um, it's more that I wanted to tempting. show. <laughs> well, yes. It's more that I wanted to show that his his virtues have his vices at the very back of them. You know, like, um, yes, he is. He is absolutely committed. He's not hypocritical, but that means he is merciless as well. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very intrigued by these qualities, which are double, you know, and also... He might think that he's, you know, self-sacrificial, but he's also a, a huge egotist because he's so proud of being good and of being stronger than the others. 
Um, and so he gets he gets kind of imprisoned in his own sense of what virtue is and what holiness is. And he becomes, you know, an island in the sense that no man is meant to be an island, but he really becomes one. And um, he's fairly lonely to start with. And he just makes himself more and more lonely. And, you know, this could be a real little community they have, but he manages to he manages to, you know, his, his heart freezes up and he manages to come, cut himself off from these the two men he chose to bring with him. Um, so it's a kind of a, a, a parable of how some some virtues, specifically religious ones, can, I suppose, any one virtue, if you if you follow it to the end, and um, can can harden into something repulsive, um, just as you know the the sheer obedience and, and dogged loyalty of of Trian and Cormac. There comes a moment when they have to say, "I'm just being a fool here." You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there's also a parable, as you said earlier, about the environment, you know, that, that anyone reading it now says, oh, look, from the moment they arrive, as you say, on the island. Could you take us through, uh, could you help me with the pronunciation of the great orc? Or, or. Great Ox, yeah, yeah. Um, this is the only book I've written and that, that draws really closely on an archaeological report. I've used a lot of historical sources before, but this time I needed to get back before the texts. And so there's a, a wonderful in-depth ar- archaeological report on Skellig Michael that that um, shows, you know, what they were eating and so on. But of course, it shows more of, of the later centuries when there were quite a few of them there. So lots of sheep bones and goat bones and cow bones and so forth, and imported things like wine and grain and so on. But I was trying to imagine how how a very, you know, absolutist um, first party would would live there. And even though we don't have bones of great auks um, among among the, the birds that they did eat, we know that they ate mostly birds. And I, I looked at a lot of um, Atlantic seaboard communities um, to try and work out how they might possibly have been living there. So I didn't just look at Ireland. I looked at, at you know, um, islands off Scotland, um, Newfoundland, that kind of thing. And I would say the Great Auk, which was this massive, upright, sort of child-sized bird, it was a huge food source um, and it was eaten into extinction. Um, so I thought, OK, I'm going to have one of the key birds on Skellig. And I, I really chose a, a cast of bird species just as I was choosing a cast of humans. I thought one of my key birds is going to be one that I know um, became extinct because and they That's couldn't a lovely fly. example. Mm-hmm. No, they couldn't fly. Now they they could swim, right? But and they couldn't they couldn't fly away. So they were very vulnerable to being just you know grabbed and throttled. And um, I found in one particular source, I think it was 16th century Newfoundland. Um, I I'd been mulling over how on earth the men are to cope when they run out of firewood. You know, so I found this source um, in Newfoundland where they described um, a fire of puffins to cook puffins. And the idea of this kind of hellish Bruegel scene of of birds being used as fuel and as food in in a just kind of, you know, endless circle of of wasteful consumption of these birds. Um, so, So I decided that birds would be absolutely central to the monk's kind of survival economy and that the great auk should be one of them. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering where you got that image because it's a very powerful one at the sort of waste where in, in order to cook, you, you get the flesh of birds and you make that as though it's wood, which, of course, is going to burn very quickly. And, and you read it thinking these people are desecrating this island. But but you, but but you're very careful with that. I mean, there's no Emma Donahue preaching in this book. Uh, you know, it, it's done very organically and it's done where the reader gets the sense of it. But you also get the sense of their need for it. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's the thing. Because of the survival plot, you 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 go along with them even when they're clubbing a baby seal and so on. You may wince, but you don't you don't turn against them because um we're in the mind of each of these men in turn and you know that they they want their next dinner. We all want our next dinner. Um and of course they they also don't they don't know for sure that they're going to wreck the environment on the island. I mean that kind of mindset wasn't there. You you didn't even yet have the sort of Saint Francis mindset of oh the 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 birds and the bees are our brothers and sisters. Um, I gave a, a a sort of little nascent bit of Saint Francis style spirituality to Trian just because he's the kind of you know sensitive young man who who might well feel a sort of flicker of fellow feeling towards the baby puffin. But, you know, the church at the time was was still speaking in very sort of colonial terms of, you know, all this has been given to us. This is our banquet. Um, so, so, yes, I wanted you to feel very torn between, you know, 
the, the natural wish for the main characters to survive. And on the other hand, a kind of abhorrence at the way they are, you know, stepping onto this island and just, you know, shedding, shedding blood and feathers and bone, you know, that 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 um, compost heap they have <laughs> builds yeah, up so yeah. quickly, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, the um I mean what's what's also interesting is that art is sometimes right. And when he says at the very beginning, you know, we're just going to go on this boat where it takes us. We will find my vision because that's what God is going to give us. And stop worrying, stop asking the questions, because something will come our way. And so much of the time that does happen, that it is as though his sort of, it's not stoicism, but it is accepting the will of God is actually right in the novel, that you, that you, you, know, you, you don't make him an idiot. No, so. like in, in in some ways he might seem like the the stern leader, but his model of leadership is is in 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 some ways what we would probably call Zen. You know, a, a sort of radical acceptance of you know the the random movements of the the wind and the waves. Um, he's he's a funny mixture that way. And yes, I wanted to suggest that you know his kind of you know mad zeal. You know, these communities would never have been founded without it. It was not a sensible thing to do, to to go and live on every little, you know, isolated spike of rock. And um, so these extraordinary communities were founded because of this, you know, crazy courage um, and, and, and love of austerity for its own sake. And, you know, extraordinary works of art like, like the Book of Kells came out of this sort of lifestyle of, you know, complete um, commitment of 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 your body and mind um to making something beautiful um uh you know there was a special word for the kind of depression that only scribes had you know this was a this was an extraordinarily tiring and and physically difficult um task and the idea that they they did it in circumstances when you know uh, they had their own physical needs to see to but no they decided that copying books came first and of course you know there's an obvious metaphor there that you know you do you know yourself con that uh, writing books can feel like this too you oh, yeah. know like oh, the world yeah. is full of books yeah. why am i why am i going to such efforts to make more you know <laughs> what think, is this um, compulsion yeah. well, one of the things that's marked your work so many of the books is how lightly you wear research you you wear your research and how much research you must do for certain books. So this book, for example, obviously we talked about bird life. We talked about the topography of the island itself. The island is a player in this game. It's not somewhere you haven't been. It's somewhere you have not only imagined, but obviously you've looked at it very, very carefully, the different levels, the plateaus, how certain places are reached. And you've obviously done research on how to build a house on an island with stone. So I mean, in other words, it's a big drama because, of course, the prior wants the church built, the little church built first. He wants the altar built. And the, the other two say, well, yeah, we'd be great if we could build a shelter for ourselves. The winter's coming. He said, no, 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 you'll do this first. And then we, we get, a very, I think, a very beautifully light account, but a fully, I, I struck me as accurate account of how you would build a house on an island. How, how do you know that? Um, thank God for all those... Uh, Actually, men in many cases who who will put um, step by step instructions and videos online of their various skills. There are lots of reenactors. There are enthusiasts for you know sort of Neolithic life who tell you how they you know um, um, carved their own pipe out of a out of a swan bone that kind of thing. And and with the stone building, yes, I found marvelous sites that took me step by step through the shaping of a stone and and which stones to choose and the bad qualities to look out for and the the ways to wet a stone and try and per sort of perceive its hidden weaknesses. And one thing I realized is that it's all about choosing the right stones and then having an eye for the perfect stone. You don't want to have to shape the stone to a great degree. So it's it's much better if you spot the correct stone as if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle. But of course, as time goes on, you've collected all the good stones and now you're roaming over the entire island, picking up stones that are not the right shape at all. So the task would get harder and harder as you go along. Um, and yes, I love the fact that, that's, that stone building is a very sort of sensible, pragmatic business based on principles of physics and geology. But of course, um, art is bringing in a spiritual set of priorities and saying, yes, altar first and then chapel and so on. <laughs> you know, um, we're always putting off the need to to make a roof over their heads. Um, yeah, so I mean, even... I, 
Sorry, even Thanks, though the Skelligs are, are most known for those little beehive huts, yeah. you know, they were not the earliest thing built. And um, there's no reason to believe that they would have been a priority. They're just such a perfect shape that they have tended to last very well. Yeah. I mean, I hesitate to say this to you, but you're, you're also a bit of an expert on bird killing and on how to get oil out of certain birds. Uh, um, I mean, I is, is there uh, I mean, tell us about that? Um, well, uh, yes, I don't think I found any videos of how to squeeze them, but there were certainly a lot of um, a lot of videos uh, showing you how to pluck, for instance, you know, what order to 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 pluck um, the different feathers and what angle to pull them at and so on. Um, so so, yes, I, I, I did a lot of haunting message boards where people would consult each other on how, for instance, how you would keep fire alive when you were traveling, you know. So people out there who have really made themselves little reinforced leather pouches to carry coals in. Um, I've never done any of this historical recreation stuff myself. Um, I've never I've never killed a bird. Um, I've barely jointed a chicken. But at the theoretical level. Actually, one friend of mine, after reading this book, said, Emma, I had the impression that you'd be a great person to bring along camping, but I happen to know you're not. You know? <laughs> it's pure theoretical that's, knowledge. That, that's what the imagination is for. And, the, the, and of course, it's temporary you knowledge. Do. You know, um, I my my knowledge of the birds would be blurred again already because I have to keep making room for the next book by uh, you know clearing out the files. So it's, I, it's I mean, a curious what, form of human knowledge. One of the things you mentioned earlier is that the, the priority, strangely, that the prior has is he wants to, them to continue in copying the books. The whole idea that this this was part of their task, which is the one of the great sort of glories of medieval Ireland, that, that they did do this over and over. And um, there's a beautiful description on page 152. It's um, Trian, who really doesn't want to do this. I mean, he, it isn't, he really loads it. And there's a moment where... The prior says to him, well, now, now we've got all these candles or these, we've made these sort of um, tallow things. You can you can do it at night as well. We're just dust driving him really <laughs> very close to the edge. But he says uh, um, he must faithfully replicate what he sees, splitting his attention between exemplar and copy. So it's not to get lost in the gap. He dips his nib again. The ideal is a controlled flat flow, a gliding stream with no waves, no rocks, no gaps. Downward strokes are smoother, following the natural pull of the ink. Upward ones are precarious. Lift the pen, reposition as precise footed as a waiting bird. The key is never to let his own unworthy skin touch the surface. His left hand must hover in the air. Only the arm moves so lightly that a watcher mightn't notice. Trian should barely even put nib to page, transmitting the ink like the lightest of caresses. And it's, I think that's a lovely description of writing itself, of attempting to write a novel like this, where you're you're not you're withholding judgment. You're not. Oh, oh, you don't overdo um, sunsets or, you know, starlight or like you don't have big. I mean, there are a few moments where you let yourself go, but not much. It's very the novel is very controlled. It is as though they weren't seeing sunsets in that way. They weren't seeing the night sky. So you're not actually going to write like a 19th century novelist um, describing landscape that the landscape they take almost for granted. They take the sea. They, they take the look of things for granted. Yeah, I, I do. Rather than trying to have a sort of, a sort of you know, Emma Donahue's style, I really try to kind of surrender to what each book needs. And so my style often differs greatly because it's all about what my characters would notice, what my characters would see and getting the sort of idiom of their minds. Um, and as you say, yeah, the, the book is quite restrained in many ways and repetitious in many ways and uh, does not dole out its drama in, in great big dollops. Um yeah, Trian, I think I was quite influenced by, um, you know, my my son who, you know, if you give him some exciting, physically demanding situation, he'd be great at it. If you said like, you know, catch us a baby seal, we're starving. But, um, you know, getting to him to write an essay was always a, a, a punitive business. <laughs> so I, um, I was very interested in writing about somebody who was full of skills and vitality and energy, but who would find it um, a crippling burden to be uh, sitting in a hot writing. And with his left hand too, um, Trian and is a, a kithog, a left-hander. So he's kind of marked out as a bit, as a bit odd, a bit um, you know, um different and strange from the beginning, um, even just by being left-handed. So it it didn't take much to make you to make you um, a bit of a freak in medieval society, you know. Um so so yeah, um yeah, I read a lot about the difficulties of left-handers, and there were quite a few left-handed scribes, we can tell. Um, but but it wasn't easy for them because they were always pushing the nib instead of, you know, drawing the ink smoothly. 
I hadn't thought of that. Um, the figure of Cormac, um, it comes across as the storyteller. And it, it, it makes clear that they're operating in a very small world where there's a great deal of talk, you know, where one saint becomes famous for this. I mean, the whole idea of what you call the cross vigil um, is, um, you know, um, that, 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 that saint in Wicklow, you help me with this, it's in Kevin. Kevin, that, yeah, um, yeah. But that those sort of stories are now spreading. That the whole idea of the lives of the saints, uh, that that even though this is a world where communication is very difficult, nonetheless, the, um, Cormac has been collecting these stories and the prior is irritated. The prior wants him to be silent and obedient. But every so often when something occurs, he he is the one, he is he is the one with the with that sort of information. He's carrying that as well as all the treasure they they have, or not treasure, but the, but the various things they have in the chest that they um they have Cormac who can tell the stories. Yes, and I wanted um I suppose I always thought of these three as a bit like the Trinity. So I wanted an older one, a middle-aged one, and a younger one. And the middle-aged one would clearly have all this power, but the younger one would have some physical strengths and vitality and sharp eyes and so on that the others wouldn't. But equally, I thought the older man would would know things that the others wouldn't. Um, so even though he might feel himself to be in a humble position, in fact, they absolutely need his knowledge of gardening and stonecraft and and his, his, his collection of stories too. And I wanted to make him a convert, you know, like like many in, in Christian Ireland at the time. He had begun as pagan and then in a very pragmatic way he'd um he'd switched over, but he'd brought with him that sense of, you know, like, you know, what's a good story and uh, who are the sort of vivid characters. And I like the idea that, that the saints, although this rather homogenous group of say Scottish men, that in fact they would they would be a sort of a, a, a pantheon of interesting characters, um, you know, some very harsh and some much more friendly. And you even get contrasting stories about the same saint. Um, um, I think there's one story about the, the one that Seamus Heaney famously used in a poem of, of Kevin finding that a, a, a bird nested in his palm when he was in cross vigil. He stayed in that position until she had, um, you know, got her nestlings out into the world. But there's other stories where he, he curses or smites birds. So the attitude to nature in that early Christian uh, literature is very interestingly ambivalent. I mean, for every charming anecdote, and nowadays there's a huge emphasis on Celtic Christianity as this kind of lovely new agey Christianity, but but there were a lot of stories of, you know, um, birds punished and, um, um, you know, um, a very sort of harsh and combative attitude, um, you know, the whole stands of oak cut down if they were in the wrong place. Um, so, so you know, you, you get a wonderful ambivalence about whether nature is our, our friend or our enemy in these, in these texts. Um, I noticed with the stories that you're still being restrained, that there might have been a temptation to let the stories go over a page and a second page to go into great detail by St. Bridget and St. Kieran. But again, once again, you allow silence and you allow the prior's disapproval sort of govern that, where, where we don't get garrulousness. We get the wind, uh, you know, and we don't, as, just, just as we don't get big storms, just as we don't have big accidents, just as we don't have people from the mainland attacking them. Instead, we have what we might call slow accretion and total immersion, that we are in their world. There are only three of them. And the, 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 the arguments between them are not large ones, but they become large. But slowly we get taken into their world and becomes immensely dramatic. The sort of way that power can be used, stubbornness, fanaticism, that those those large words be, become by the end of the book become clear that we're watching a real drama going on between, in a way, hardness, softness, dictatorship, democracy, even, even um, religious fanaticism versus an openness, you know, ideological openness, that those sort of big dramas are happening in this small place with three characters without any large implements, fictional implements being used by you. By the end of the book, where we are actually dealing with a sort of a major, major subjects. I mean, serious ones that preoccupies deeply now. I suppose for me, it was the perfect microcosmic situation in that they were not only very few in number. I mean, you know, the original party probably would have been about a dozen, but I decided, you know, to go for a sort of very 
perilous situation where they have such a tiny group that if one of them dies, probably the other will, the other two will as well. So I decided to go for three. And they're not just any three people. They're three people absolutely united by this ideological adventure, this, this ambition to set up this monastery. And yet they, they're coming at it very differently. It's very much the idea of one of them and the others are, are, are pulled along. So it seemed a perfect situation to kind of create a family and to immediately have things start going wrong um, at a sort of a micro but very, very dramatic level. Um, um, you know, we, we, we fought a big battle, I suppose, um, some of us and then the generation before in Ireland and elsewhere about the right to be very sexually frank um, in a novel to dramatise sexuality as much as we wanted. And there were a lot of people against this. And one of the great gifts of this winning this battle was the ability to decide not we don't have to use it all the time. You know, in other words, that you could write a novel, which is chase, which really, really just is not going to give you the obvious. I mean, if you're going to have three, three men, three celibate men arriving on an island, there are novelists who would just say, well, I think I know what we do in chapter two. It might seem as if I've thrown away a good opportunity. Yeah, and, you know, for me, it totally yeah. depends on the book. I have, I think I've it's written two books about this. sex workers, for instance. There's loads of sex in those books. And this one there isn't because it would seem just the obvious gag. You know, if I want to show things going wrong um, on, a, on a very sort of pure monastic island, it just... It's like a Boccaccio, you know, a story or something to immediately having have them having sex. Um, so I just decided that I, I wanted the dramas to be to be otherwise, you know. And also I did want the whole thing to hinge on gender in the end, um, so, because it, it's a very deliberately all male community. You know, the, the prior thinks that he's managed to set women aside, you know, put away that messy, troublesome half of the human race, you know, get away from all that, have a pure island. So I wanted to really set him up for a great fall. Um, so in a way, I was playing a longer game, you know, rather than having their sexual desires early on bubble up and start to cause trouble. Um, I was really wanting to allow the prior to to think that he's created a situation where everything's controlled and and, and pure um, because they're all men and where the he's very interested in reproduction, but the reproduction of the books, you know, and I wanted to really set him up for an enormous disappointment. disappointment. Um, in July, when you go to the island, um, I mean, there, there, you, you really could open a novel with a great description of him. Um, as she looked up at the island, she realized that she had already been there. That when she saw the bird, she realized that she had not only imagined, but seen in full their ancestors, the other puffins in the sixth century. That when she walked on the steps, when she saw even the little little dwellings, they had the beehive dwellings, she knew the stone. She had already built some of those things. I is this um is this journey you're going to make um in the summer? Um I mean, I would I long to read your blog or read or read your account or, or even watch you've been Do you know what worries me, Colm? Filmed. Ever. What if I get there and <laughs> I, I I realize I got it wrong? You know, there could be aspects that aren't a bit like how I imagined it. And I may have to just make my peace with that, you know. Yeah, but 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 maybe. I mean I think we I, I think we would have to make the, the point that it's it seems so topographically accurate, whether it is or not. It seems so emotionally accurate and it seems so intensely so. And also the whole idea of the survival. I mean, how you light a fire, how you how, how you, you know, how where you have to how you get the eggs, you know, what can you live on? You know, at the arrival of a lobster, for example. Um, that all those things are just so accurately done. And also your description of the act, what the things that grow on the on on the island. I mean, all of that, you, you actually created a universe. And I think the last thing that matters for a moment is whether it's connected, you know, in a I suppose direct topographical way to Skellig Michael, but it is it is actually correct, connected <laughs> directly to my imagination. Because well, I will comfort there. myself with that if I get there and I don't seem to recognize anything, you know. And of course, I may not get there because even nowadays, you know, the the weather is such a huge force around the Skelligs that um, but, um, it's not always yeah, possible the, the weather to is land becoming, that. Yeah. I mean, Elizabeth Bishop wrote, is it lack of imagination makes us come to imagined places? You know, she saw tourism as a sort of failure to imagine and you have to go, which is a sort of, um, uh, you know, but but anyway, really congratulations on the book. It's it's, it's very intense. And um, 
uh, you turn the page all the time with really wonder and admiration at the way you have built this world. And thank you very much for talking to me. Well, thank you for your... I knew yeah. you would be a pleasure to talk to you about this. No, and it was really, it was really great reading the book and great talking to you.